already, I think she is the queen of mystery. What is Death on the Nile about? Let me tell you about the characters we meet in chapter one to give you a little bit of a character guide. Something I hope they include in the movie is, I mean, even his mustache had a tragic backstory. Overall, I left the theater feeling a little So far, I have only made a very small dent in Agatha Christie's extensive collection of work, but already I think she is the queen of mystery. Favorites of mine include Murder on the Orient Express, and And Then There Were None, which is an all-time favorite. Her books are really a blueprint for what we know as commonplace murder mysteries. I mean, come on, an isolated setting where someone dies and we don't know who the murderer is? Epic. Last night, I also finished a reread of Death on the Nile in preparation for seeing the movie tomorrow night. We all know that the book is always better than the movie, but I love to compare them and really find comparisons and things that the movie did well and things that it missed out on in the book. Reading the book and then criticizing why the movie isn't better than the book is one of my favorite pastimes. I guess I'm just judgmental like that. Let's start with what is Death on the Nile about? Much like Murder on the Orient Express, we have our main detective, Hercule Perrault, and we are following along as he solves crimes. Death on the Nile was written in 1937, and in this story, we are following Hercule Perrault as he is on vacation, and he wants to take a little cruise down the Nile and explore Egypt. What appealed to me initially about this story is I love travel, and if there's travel in a book to a new place, I love it. I love visualizing all the adventures and the sights, so that is something that definitely appealed to me in this book, and it does not disappoint. We also have another isolated setting, which I think is one of Christie's specialties because our characters are on a boat on the Nile, and surprise, surprise, there's a death says right there, I'm not spoiling anything. There's a murder and we have to decide of the people on the boat who did it. One thing to note in Agatha Christie's writing style, especially in these three books, is that she throws a lot of characters at you at one time. And this can be chaotic and confusing and hard to keep track of, but it really does its job because firstly, you're wondering who is gonna be the victim, who's gonna get murdered, and then it gives you a huge cast to choose from for the murderer. So it can be a little bit to get used to at first. This is one reason why I don't like to read her novels on audiobook. I like to read them physically because oftentimes I have to go back and reread or flip back some pages and I find it a little bit more helpful to read it physically. That being said, let me tell you about the characters we meet in chapter one to give you a little bit of a character guide. Firstly, we have Lynette Ridgway. She is about 20 years old. She is young, she is stunningly beautiful, and she is richer than Midas. So we start off with a lot of envy over what she has because she really seems to have it all. Next, we have her friend Joanna Southwood, who also I think is pretty rich, but she doesn't seem to have such a kind nature as Lynette. Uh, she's quick to say that if any of her friends face misfortunes, she will dump them right away because she doesn't want to deal with that. Then we have Lord Windlesham, who is in love with Lynette. He wants to marry her, and Lynette is considering marrying him. Jacqueline or Jackie Bellefort, or maybe I need to work on my French pronunciation. Belle, Bellefleur? Belle, Belle, Bellefleur? But anyways, we have Jackie, and she was childhood friends with Lynette. She is not as rich, but she doesn't envy her friend for having everything that she doesn't. And we meet Jackie when she is telling Lynette all about this love that she found, and she said she will just simply die without him. They are engaged and plan to get married. And that love's name is Simon Doyle. We also are introduced to him in chapter one. We also have Tim Allerton, who is the second cousin of Joanne, and they're friends. They are two peas in a pod. It seems like they really like society gossip, and this makes his mother, Mrs. Allerton, actually very jealous. It's kind of creepy, the mother-dearest relationship they have, uh, but she loves her son. He is her favorite companion. She just doesn't understand why he likes Joanna too much. 
Then we have the young lady, Cornelia Robson, who hasn't had the most opportunity in the world, but when her Aunt Marie, also called Mrs. Van Schuler, offers to take her to Europe on a cruise down the Nile, she is thrilled. Accompanying them is Miss Bowers, who is the companion to Miss Van Schuler. Then we have Andrew Pennington, who is the American trustee to Lynette, and he finds out that she got married, which I think is a big deal probably for like who is going to be her next in line to inherit her fortune. Uh, so he's really concerned and decides to book a trip to, the, to Egypt on the same ship as her. We find out roughly around this point that Lynette got married, but not to the man that she was considering before. She actually married Simon Doyle. Drama, right? All in chapter one, homegirl goes and steals her best friend's man. That's a big deal. We also meet Mrs. Otterburn, 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 and her daughter, Rosalie. Of course, chapter one, we also see Hercule Poirot, who is our quirky and incredibly confident detective. He is world renowned. He's very famous for what he does. So we know some stuff is about to go down because all these characters planning their trip down the Nile can't be coincidence, right? Those are just some of the characters and I found those in chapter one, but we also have Mr. Ferguson, Mr. Fanthrop, Colonel Race. There is a bunch of others that come into play throughout the course of the story. So you get what I mean, that she kind of hits you with a lot of characters at once. And what I love about this one is all in chapter one, there's a lot of plot set up for us. You know that Lynette stole her best friend's man and her friend probably is not too happy about this. I have some pretty high expectations for the movie. Previous Hercule Perot movies have been pretty great. And for this one, I really want to see the visualization of their trip. I want to see the magic of Egypt. I'm expecting a over the top luxury liner that they're sailing on down the Nile. Um, I really want to feel like I'm transported into another world. And I think the movie will do a great job of that. Also, with how many characters we have, I think the movie is pretty promising because you can put a face to the name and that will really help keep everyone straight. So I think the movie is going to be pretty strong in that category as well. Something I hope they include in the movie is in chapter four, Perot is talking to Lynette and he's kind of given her a smackdown for just being a horrible person and stealing her best friend's man. He talks about you know there was a moment in time where you had a decision to make and you chose evil pretty much. And I like how he didn't just swoon all over her like everyone else because she's rich and beautiful and charming. He really just told her she's a horrible person for doing this. There's also a quote when Perot is talking to Jackie and she is distraught because she lost the love of her life, right? And he says something like, Love is not everything. We just think it is when we are young. I hope they include that line in the movie. I'm prepared for the movie to make some cuts from the book. Usually they have to do that for time constraints and also just what translates to the screen. I expect they might cut a good portion of the plot. I'm expecting a lot of the clues that are in the book that Perot picks up on are going to be eliminated. I also wonder if some of the characters are going to be eliminated as well, some of the more supporting characters. And without spoiling anything, I'll just say, I'm wondering if the extent of the crime will be mirrored in the movie as it is portrayed in the book. So I'm just gonna leave it at that because I don't wanna spoil anything. I think they'll do a good job. They did a good job with Murder on the Orient Express. So I think it'll be a good representation. I'm so excited to see it going on a double date tomorrow night to check it out. And I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. And I get to be a snobby critic that gets to judge every aspect of it. Is the book really better than the movie in this case? I'll let you know. All right, I am back and let's talk about this movie. Before we get started on this cinematic adventure though, please drop a comment down below with the ship emoji if you're still watching, and add a couple words if you like murder mysteries. 
For me, I grew up watching them. My mom is a huge fan. Hi, mom. So I was actually familiar with Hercule Poirot before reading these books recently and before watching this movie. The movie started out on a really weird tone. They opted to give Poirot a little bit of a backstory and it seemed kind of out of place. I mean, even his mustache had a tragic backstory. I love how well his quirks and OCD tendencies translate to the screen. It's really fun to watch and definitely gives you the feel that because he's so OCD and likes things in a very particular order, that's how he's so observant because something is slightly out of place or different than what he thinks it should be and that's how he finds his clues. As the movie is getting started, there is an opening dance scene at a nightclub and it was super high energy and hot and sexy and all the things. I'm sure it was a more modern take on the dancing that they actually did in 1937, but who cares? It was so much fun. I mentioned that I was really excited for the imagery of Egypt and to be transported to another place. And I mean, that was okay. I wasn't really blown away. There were some great images and ancient sites of Egypt, which were pretty cool. But what really took me back in time were the costumes. When I got home, I looked up an article which was an interview with the costume designer, Paco Delgado, who viewed Lynette as very fragile and being surrounded by people that she couldn't trust. So Paco decided to dress Lynette in very transparent, flimsy, light, flowy fabrics to kind of represent that fragility and how Lynette didn't have the armor to face all these things that surrounded her. When it comes to Jackie, who is driven by love and revenge, this passion was represented by her constantly being in the color red. I particularly liked how Perot was dressed and I wish this fashion would come back around for men because it is so dapper and elegant and I love it. In the beginning, he, along with the rest of the cast, are on vacation. So they are often dressed in all white. There's this scene where he's at the pyramids and he's wearing this all white suit and a hat and it's just my favorite. It looks incredible. But the whole cast is dressed in lighter colors in the beginning because it's breezy, they're on vacation, it's hot, they're relaxed. But as these darker themes start taking over, they transition to wearing darker colors. And I thought that was really interesting. What we really need to talk about though is that necklace. Of course, I'm referring to the 128 carat, $30 million Tiffany's diamond. This was previously worn by Audrey Hepburn when she was promoting Breakfast at Tiffany's, and this was on loan from Tiffany's for this movie. And if you forget that this is a Tiffany's necklace, don't worry, they'll remind you. I was disappointed to see that a lot of the dialogue I was hoping that would be in the movie was not, but I did get a lot of practice with accents and definitely feel motivated to get back to studying my French because um, Hercule Poirot was a little difficult to understand sometimes, so I need to work on that. I was definitely right in my predictions that there would be cuts to the characters, but I think I actually like the liberties they took with these characters. Firstly, Cornelia and Miss Bowers were combined into one character, so I liked that. It's just one face that you need to recognize and one name. They also combined the Doctor and Lord Windlesham into one character, and it was played by Russell Brand, who was completely unrecognizable in this dramatic role. He did a fantastic job. I normally think he's like a goofball playing really weird off the wall characters, but he is a really good actor. He did great. Rosalie Otterborn was a niece, not a daughter. She was her aunt's business manager. She was super intelligent and I really enjoyed her character. Her aunt, Mrs. Otterborn, instead of being a novelist, she was a blues singer. And this added an element of music to the movie, which obviously you're not gonna get that same kind of vibe in a book because you can't hear it, but having this music in the movie was an incredible touch. I really enjoyed it. I love Perot's style to kind of accuse everyone of murder because it makes you feel like anybody is a possibility of being the murderer. It makes it super engaging. The movie did make some slight changes to the plot, which were okay. I kind of don't have an opinion one way or the other on it. It made it fun because it was different from the book. I didn't 
always know precisely what was gonna happen because of these small changes. Overall, I was very happy to see that the movie stayed very true to the book in terms of the plot around the murder mystery, so I was very pleased with that. Overall, I left the theater feeling a little melancholy, which I suppose is not a surprise after watching a movie about murder, but I attribute this to the whole backstory they gave Perot, and it was kind of tragic and sad, and so there wasn't really a happy ending. Which again, not surprising, it's about murder. <laughs> not everybody makes it out of the movie that went into it. But the book didn't have that same tone. The book was a little bit more hopeful, I guess? Maybe a little bit cutesy? A little? But the movie had a completely different tone due to that backstory. Um, I just, I felt a little sad. I do think the movie did a very good job representing the book. It was true to the actual murder mystery plot. They made some slight changes to the characters in combining them and giving them a little bit more depth and substance, I suppose. So I really liked that aspect and then there's less characters to, to remember. Um, I did not like the tragic backstory that they gave Perot. I thought that was unnecessary and seemed just kind of like out of place and weird. Um, but the costumes were fantastic, great imagery. Watching it was very dazzling. The dance scene was high energy. So I enjoyed watching it. Hopefully this video motivated you to both read the book and watch the movie Death on the Nile. I think you won't regret it. I'm curious to hear your thoughts if you've seen it. Please leave a comment down below what you thought of the movie. Thanks so much for stopping by and I'll see you next time.